Good morning. Brenda, thank you for playing for us this morning. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Of course, you're getting to be here quite a bit, aren't you? Well, yeah. I don't think so. So it's good to see everybody here this morning. Prayers, prayer requests, anything people would like to announce. Dell, what you got? Okay, <laughs> I think Rochester General and we have a love-hate relationship because we've been up there so much. Um, John did have his uh, carotid artery surgery on Friday and that went well. Uh, he's scheduled to have a bypass surgery on Tuesday, but that I guess remains to be seen until he, they actually decide to do it. So he's. He's uh, still up there in Rochester General, and uh, so that's all the news I have right now. <laughs> I just appreciate so much your, your caring thoughts and prayers, and so does he. And um, uh, He does have a cell phone if anybody wants to call him, but I would suggest that's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> He's in a good mood, but, you know, <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot. morning, Cindy. Thank you for your prayers for me moving back home. Um, things are working out great. Um, we're still a few weeks away, but I think a lot of the hurdles have been crossed. And thanks to God, everything works out good when you think positive. Thanks. Others? Um, we have a treat today. I want to welcome Pat LaBarbara, who will be doing our message today. Well, it's actually Pasquale, though, right? But I didn't know if that's how I should introduce you. So, so he's been here before. We welcome him. It's great. And we're looking forward to your, what, five, six-minute sermon? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great. <laughs> um, that's all I have. If nobody else has anything, we'll announce. Brenda, your prelude, please.
Thank you, Brenda. Our call to worship today <clears throat> is from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in fatness. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Thanks be to God. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, offer prayers for the congregation, so if you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, we gather here today thanking you that we live in a nation that allows us to meet as a group and worship you, Lord. And we know this is not possible in every country and every place on earth, but today we joyfully thank you that we can do that here. And Lord, we have many prayers, many needs, many things, but we come to you with happy hearts because we know you are our God. You are our Lord, and you have given us the greatest gift in your Son of Jesus Christ. Today, specifically today, we think of John as he's in the hospital, recovering from one surgery, getting ready for another one. So Lord, we, we pray that you will be with his doctors and be with him and help him heal and help him get through this. And Lord, we also pray for Dell as she holds down the fort and tries to keep him calm and we just pray, Lord, for the two of them, that you will be with them and surround them with your love. Lord, we celebrate that things are going well for Cindy's move. Lord, it's just a great thing. It's a lot of stress. Moving is always hard, but, it's, but we know you're with her, and we know you're giving her peace, and things seem to be going pretty well, and we're, we celebrate that. Lord, on a personal note, I offer prayer for Jerry Barrett and his family, Gloria and Curtis, his unexpected passing. Um, we just hope, Lord, that you will surround Gloria and Curtis with, with your love and comfort and know that you are with them during this rough time. And on another joyful note, Lord, we pray for Pastor David and Ruth Ann while they bask in the sun of Florida, although I hear it's not as warm as they would like, but give them peace and Get Dave rested up, get his batteries charged, so in a couple weeks when he comes back, he'll be invigorated and excited to continue spreading your word, your love, to this community here in Interlaken. So Lord, that's what I have, but I'm sure there are thoughts and prayers and needs on everybody's hearts here today. So Lord, I'll, I'll give, give a few moments for them to offer up their silent prayers. Heavenly Father, we know you hear these prayers. You know, we know you know the concerns that are on each of our hearts. So Lord, please comfort them, grant them as your will desires. And in this time, Lord, we'll pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, let's all stand and celebrate. Well, okay, how about the kids go to children to worship now? If they want to. Or they can stay here and sing hymns with us. The rest of us, let's all stand and start by singing hymn number 361. Hallelujah.
and let's continue with hymn number 455, I Am Thine, O Lord. still standing, let's have Jim bring up the offering and we'll sing the doxology. Father, we thank you that we are able to give these gifts. Give these gifts to this church and to you to continue your work here in Interlake and in abroad as the consistory has decided which missions to support, what people, we, what we can do with your funds to help the people in need. So Lord, we thank you. We know this is all yours to begin with, but it's just something we can do to help continue your work here in the Interlaken area. So Lord, we thank you for this communion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's see, we've managed to use 16 minutes of the service so far. Did you hear that, Dave? 16, where are Anyway, so, because Pat told me, you know, he keep kept asking me, how much time do I get? And I said 10 to 12 minutes, and he goes 30 to 40 minutes, I said 12 to 15, he goes 40 to 45, and so. So, we got the first part done fairly quickly, so he's free to spend as much time as he wants for the next 20 minutes. No. <laughs> but thank you, Pat, for being here today.
Test one, two. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I will try coming up here. I will probably end up down on the floor, but we'll try. Um, so a couple of things I have to ask you to forgive me right off the bat. Um, number one, I have been a missionary in Ukraine for the last 20 years. Um, what that means is I haven't probably preached in English in a very long time. Uh, we've been, uh, oh, I should probably introduce, the lovely woman in the end, that's my two-month-old daughter, no. The lovely woman in the end is my wife, right? This is my two-month-old daughter. This is my 16-year-old daughter. That's how I know God loves me, 16-year gap between teenage girls, right? <laughs> my 14-year-old boy, and then my three-year-old boy is preaching in Sunday school. So, no, he's back there playing with the other kids. Um, right now, we have been in America for two years, um, and strangely enough, we came back to America, and I thought, okay, we're here, they're going to have to learn English, um, we're going to go to school, we're going to figure this whole thing out, we're going to maybe get an apartment, then get a house, whatever the case may be, and there is a school that is a part of a church not far from our home, because technically my two older children are not American, they're Ukrainian. Right? So they can't go to public school because that, that would be public funded and that's against the rules. So they have to go to a private school or all this good stuff so that we can become American. That's the reason we moved back. The law says that they have to live here for four years to become American. So we moved back for that purpose only. Just coincidentally, I know boss, no coincidence, but it happened that it was COVID in the beginning of the war. So we were here when the war had begun. Anyway, so we moved back for that and when we started to go to a private school, just so happens that it's the school is called Southeast Christian Academy. It's a part of Southeast Bible Baptist Church. Not that I'm a Baptist, they are just the two of them connected together. So we, we began going there, and I don't know how. You can ask them. I would just show up, sit in the back thinking, I don't have to preach. I actually get to go to church for, a long, for, for the first time in a long time. And then 30 refugee families showed up, and now I'm the Ukrainian Sunday school teacher. So <laughs> I'm still in America, still teaching every Sunday morning in Russia. So... If I get lost, you guys stare at me, I'll look down at them, they'll tell me what the word is in English and we'll get back to it. Fair enough? All right. If you have them or if they're up here, where are we gonna start? Oh yes, this is always fun. My name is Pasquale Giuseppe Cristoforo La Barbera. That's why Pat is a whole lot easier for people to remember. It's only funny because my parents are from Sicily. I was born on Easter. Easter in Italian is Pasca. So I was born on Easter. They named me Easter. So my first name is Easter, just in Italian, and none of the Americans really know that. In Russian, there isn't another word. So I am Easter La Barbara, and they're looking at me like, you're Easter? I'm like, the Easter Bunny, white, you fuck. <laughs> so it works out. All right, if you want to pick up to my first slide, please, I would appreciate it. All right, we're going to go over 1 Samuel. Um, now, a couple things you should know. Um, number one. I am more a professor teacher than a pastor preacher. I have pastor churches. I have started six churches in my life, but I'm more of a professor. So I'm used to having a chalkboard or a board next to me where I can draw up. So if you see me look up there and point to things, it's because I'm used to having something next to me, number one. Uh, number two, that's more my style of preaching is to educate you on what it says and then connect it to our lives. I'm sure most of you know that you can take scripture three ways, right? You take it doctrinally. You can take it historically, and you can take it spiritually. So I like to look at all three different parts. Um, second thing I believe, and I believe this with all of my heart, that God preaches a sermon to the preacher first and gets him right, then he can share it to the congregation. So this is something God was pointing at me over the last two weeks that I'm going to share with you. Okay? So 1 Samuel chapter 15. Um, now, again, one other housekeeping thing. Um, I don't know, did you change it or did you leave it the way that I had it? All right. Um, no, no, you're fine. First, the next slide. I am old school. I, uh, I read a King James um, only because I went to two different seminaries. I have two different bachelors and a master's, and all of it was in King James, and I just don't want to memorize new verses in a different text, so that's just what I'm used to. All right? So, first one. Um, there you go. Asking the unthinkable. This is what we're going to talk about. What it says... 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1 says, Samuel, who also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over Israel. 
Now, therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. So we get the idea, right? You, I'm sure you guys know the story. Israel's like, we want a king. We want a king. And of course, God's like, uh, I, I, I'm the king. You, you really don't want a king. They're like, no, no, no. We, we really want a king. They're like, if you get a king, it's going to be like this and like this and like this. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. We really want to have a king. Any parents have this conversation with their kids? Like, I really want to do this. No, I'm telling you, you really don't want to do that. No, 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 I really want to do that. It's not going to be good for you to do that. No, but I really want to. It's that same, same discussion, right? Verse number two, we'll, we'll skip it, just the continuation of that. Verse number three, it says, okay, now go and smite the Amicalites. This is what God is having Samuel tell Saul. Go and kill the Amalekites and utterly destroy all that they have. Right? I remember I live in Ukraine, so we kind of know what this feels like at the moment. But <clears throat> utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. Uh, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Really? Like God told him kill everything? All of it. Women, children, my two-year, two-month-old baby. That's... Anybody think that's a little bit over the top? I'm, I'm thinking that's over the top. Do you think we have a God who doesn't ask us to do things that are over the top? I was in my last year of medical school, 10 years of medical school, in my residency, doing surgeries. And God's like, yeah, out. You got to go to seminary. Hey, uh, boss, who's going who's gonna to pay for that 10 years? Eh, we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay. Right? I'm just telling you, God might ask you to do something that's a little bit unthinkable. It's a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Next, how did they actually answer? How did Saul and the people follow it? Hit the next one. Here we go. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou hast come to Shur, and that's over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, Amalekites, excuse me, Amalekites, alive. I thought we were supposed to kill them all. But he took the king alive, okay? And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But, watch out for the buts in the Bible. But Saul and the people spared Agag, right? And the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and of all that was good. That doesn't sound good at the moment. Um, I will tell you, this, this could be something with me when... Um, when I went back to Ukraine, I, I, most of you know this, this past year, um, I, we were back in America. This was supposed to be my first full year. In, well, this is 2023 now, so 2022. Um, January marked my very first year fully in America. Right? We were just getting settled in, bought a house, figured all this good stuff out, and I was thinking, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And then the whole war thing kicked off in February. Uh, it was kind of a little bit unusual that the war kicked off, and then you guys know... Um, New Yorkers for Constitutional Freedoms. Have you ever heard of this? It's a, they're lobbyists, they're Christian lobbyists in Albany. Um, they're friends of mine, they're clients. I actually do their health insurance. And Jason, he called me in and he says, hey, listen, um, this whole thing's going on in Ukraine. Uh, I, I can find it on the map, but that's pretty much I know what Ukraine. Would you come in and kind of explain what's going on? Okay. So I came in and we did an interview. We put it on YouTube. And strangely enough, um, we got like 2,000 hits in like two days. Now, 2,000 is not much on YouTube, but 2,000 is a lot for this fat guy from Rochester, New York, right? right? So we're like, okay. Well, Calvary Chapel Radio saw the interview. They invited me to come in. They put me on the radio. Okay, I did the, I did the interview for them. Then the news heard it from the radio. I don't know why our like channel 8, 13, and 10 news are listening to Calvary Chapel Radio, but nonetheless, right? They're like, why don't you come do an interview for us? Okay. Right? So I came and did an interview for them, told them this is what's going on with Ukraine, this is how, this is why, this is whatever. And they're like, okay. Um, and then the next day, someone called me up and says, I would like to send you some money to help out the people on Ukraine. How do I do that? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? I've never done that before. He goes, well, don't you live in Ukraine? I'm like, I've lived in Ukraine for 19 years, yeah. Well, how do you do it? I'm like, I support myself. I, I own a business. My business pays me. Did not live in America. This is how it works. I've never taken a dime. He's like, well, I want to. You're a guy who's actually on the ground. I don't know. Uh, you would seem trustworthy. The other people, I don't know. I'm like, okay. Right? Well, I, I'll, I'll figure it out, and I'll, and I'll give you a call back. Okay. 
I'm not kidding, as the Lord is my witness, uh, by the end of that day, 10 different people called me up and asked me if they could give me money to give to Ukraine. At that point, you're looking at God going, okay, I get it, I'll, I'll figure something out. So I called my pastor in Ukraine. I was like, hey, listen, now understand, I started six churches there, all right, he's got like 32. Yeah, he's the big shot, right? And his name is Sasha Utkin, he's, he's Ukrainian. All right, and I'm like, hey, listen, Sasha, this is what's going on. Um, how can I get you the money? Do you need it? He's like, sure. I'm like, how do, how do I do it? He goes, well, you can't send the money over. I'm like, well, why not? He goes, well, there's a war going on. So the, with a war going on, no one's driving a Brinks truck, right, filling the ATMs. I'm like, oh, well, that would make sense, right? If, why would that happen? He goes, and even if you could send it over, we can only take out like 2,000 grivna a day, which is maybe like 60 bucks, and $60 doesn't really do anything. I'm like, okay. How about this? What if, what if I get... $10,000, I know the law says I can walk into the country with $10,000 in my pocket, I don't have to declare it, right? And I'll just walk across the border, give him a big hug, this is Ukraine, not America, right? So we give each other a hug and a kiss, right? I give him the $10,000, he gives me some uh, vreniki, which you guys would call pierogies, because that's what you go to Ukraine for, right? You get your pierogies, um, stay the night, turn around, walk back out, okay? Right, so I booked my ticket um, about two and a half weeks out so I could get a good flight. Now I had to fly from Rochester to JFK, JFK to Paris, Paris to Bucharest, Bucharest to Suchava, and then Suchava I had to walk across the border. Right, so I did this, um, and eventually I, I get there, and in that two weeks, um, people had sent in, I, I didn't call them, I didn't ask anybody, I didn't send out any flyers, nothing. They had sent in right around $26,000. So, yeah, I was like, praise God. So I put $10,000 in each pocket and was hoping that maybe they weren't going to ask me. Right? Uh, so I get into, uh, I get into Suchavo, which is, now you have to understand, Suchavo is kind of like Buffalo, New York. We live in a place called Chernivtsi. Chernivtsi is just like Buffalo, New York, meaning in 45 minutes I can be in Romania, in 45 minutes you can be in Canada. Right? So we live right on the border. If anything happens... We're out, right? The war is going on in like the equivalent of North Carolina, right? So I have to drive 13 hours just to get shot at, right? So this is not a really dangerous thing, right? So fly in, get to Bucharest, uh, or Suchavo, right? My guys pick me up at the airport. They take me to this, um, this house. I get to the house. Um, there's a nice little bed laying there. Now I've been traveling for what? Six different race flights, six different flights, right? So now I'm tired. I've been traveling for like 29 hours. Right? So I get there, there's a bed on the ground, I'm like, I, I lay down, pass out, wake up in the morning, and look up at the ceiling and go, where am I? <laughs> then I go into the kitchen, because that's the first thing you should do in the morning. Um, go into the kitchen, and a bunch of the kids come out from all these other doors, and they run in the kitchen, and these are kids that I know, they're kids from my church. I'm like, hey guys, where am I? Right? And they're like, you're still in Romania. I'm like, okay, whose house is this? They're like, we don't know. How many of you guys are there here? Because these are kids from a couple different families. He goes, well, I don't know, 30, 40? Like, there's 40, 30, 40 people in this one house? Yeah, whose house is it? We don't know. Like, you guys aren't really helping very much. Okay, so I wait for the parents to get up. And they come in, and they're like, okay, what's going on? Who's this? And I ask you guys, like, okay, whose house is this? They're like, we don't know. I'm like, really? <laughs> We're all staying at this house. Nobody knows whose house this is. What's going on? They're like, well, it's a Romanian family. Um, and they're a grandma and grandpa, they're like in their 70s, right? They had 13 children, and with the 13 children, um, all of them are grown now, so they had the extra rooms, so when the war started, we all ran across the border and we're hiding out here for the time being. I'm like, oh, okay. Do this, does the family speak Russian? No. Ukrainian? No. Italian? No. I'm like, guys, I'm running out of languages here, help me out. They're like, well, the daughter, she speaks a little bit of English. I'm like, okay, do any of you guys speak Romanian? No. Nobody's communicating back and forth. You guys just kind of live here. Yes. Okay. So eventually I get to talk to um, the mom and the dad through the, through the daughter. And it turns out um, that they just wanted to house these uh, Ukrainians until they could find a better place to go. So it was an intermediate, intermediary spot. And I asked them, like, how is it going? I mean, you know, you used to have zero people. It was grandma and grandpa. Now you've got 40 people. Right? How is this working out? And they're like, well... It's the first month, you know, the war just started, so we don't know what's the water bill going to be, what's the electric bill, what's the toilet paper bill, what's the food bill, like, we don't know what's going to happen. Okay, um, what's the average salary of someone in Romania, in your city? 
They figured it out, we converted it into dollars. It was like 500, $550 a month was a reasonable average salary. So I said, okay, how about if I give you three months salary, right, and then you can at least take care of these people and for three months until they can find a better place. And then they said, okay, who are you? I'm like, oh, right, I should have probably started with that. Um, I'm one of the pastors, I'm one of the guys in the church, these are, these are my church people, I want you to take care of them. Okay, so on and so forth. The reason I'm, I'm telling you all that story is back to here, where it says, but Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and the oxen, and the fatlings, and the lambs, and all, all of that was good, and so on and so forth, and would not utterly destroy them. As a guy who's never taken a dime to go to Ukraine, suddenly I have pockets of $26,000. The first thought that comes across my mind is, does that money have to pay for me to get to Ukraine? Or do I have to pay for me to get to Ukraine? Does it buy my food? Like, am, am I sparing of egg? You know, am I taking all the dime and I'm gonna spend my money to get there? Now, understood, I already took out the $10,000 from my own bank account to go to Ukraine, and God just paid that $10,000 back plus another $14,000, right? But this starts thinking, like, at what, por what portion of it is mine? Like, could God ask us to give all could God ask us too much? I mean, my wife, I had to, we had to have a deep conversation about this, right? Uh, I'm going to go into a place that's a war zone, and we don't know what it looks like. So I have to say, okay, I am the husband to a beautiful wife and the father to, at that point, three children. I didn't know that Isabella was coming yet. Um, what am I going to do? And my beautiful, amazing, spiritual wife looks at me, and she goes, you know, I would rather be widowed to a Christian martyr than married to a coward. Yep, that's my wife, right? So over we go. Now, I could not have come back. I didn't know that at that point that Sheridan FC, where we live, wasn't going to get bombed. I figured that out when I got there, and I didn't get bombed, right? It was kind of a nice thing. My question to you is, is there something that God could be asking of you all that just seems a little bit unthinkable, a little bit impossible, a little bit uncomfortable? I, I don't know what that could be. I'm not saying it has anything to do with me. I'm not saying it has anything to do with Ukraine. I'm just saying, is there something he could have asked you and maybe you held back more than you were supposed to? I don't know. We're just going to keep reading. This is just a story. Right? And then that last line, but everything that was vile and refused that they destroyed utterly. Um, when I'm taking things and I'm bringing them over to Ukraine, um, I've been very blessed that there, uh, I preached at a Messianic synagogue and there was a doctor in Delaware that heard me speak at a synagogue in Rochester. Yep, right? And she says, well, I'm also the director of surgery here, so we have a lot of our material supplies that are getting towards expiration. Why don't you drive down to Delaware and we'll just fill up your truck? Okay, so down to Delaware. Right now I'm in our garage. I have a pallet full of medical supplies that'll be sent over on Thursday. I have another pallet, a half a pallet of gospel tracts that are in Ukrainian that we're sending the people that are handing things out. And I've got two pallets full of clothes. Right? Now, some of these clothes are the vial and the refuge, so the things that people said, oh, we were never going to wear these anyway, we'll just throw them in a box and we'll send them to Ukraine, maybe that'll help. The other one is um, there's a church in Arcade that just knit a whole bunch of gloves and hats, because if you didn't know, in Ukraine right now, they shut off the electricity and the gas, so they're a living winter sleeping in their pajamas with their winter coats on, right? Um, just kind of asking that question, how far are you going? Next one, verse 13, thank you. Right? And Samuel came to Saul. This is my, my favorite part. This, this is that parent conversation. And Samuel came to Saul. Samuel being the prophet, comes to Saul, the king of Israel, and said unto him, um, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. Basically, good morning. How are you doing? Right? I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Again, and we're going to go back to that, the parents. We got parents in here, right? right? I'm, I'm looking down at my son who's probably going to start crawling under the bench in a minute and go, hey, Dean. Is your homework done? Yeah, all my homework's done. Did you do your math? Well, okay, not, all, not, not the math. Well, then your homework's not done, right? You guys had this discussion, I'm sure, with your children before, right? This is what Samuel's having with Saul. He goes, hey, did you do it? Yeah, I did it, really. Next verse. Then what means the, the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the, and the lowing of the oxen that what I hear? He says, uh, if you did everything you're supposed to do, how come the animals are running around? So do you mean that if you don't do everything that you're said to do, 
it's not being obedient. In our house, we have a rule. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Right? If you don't do it when you're supposed to, if you don't do it wholly, it's not done. Next verse. Thank you. What did Samuel call this? Next. Next one. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? That's an easy, that's like one of those rhetorical questions. Of course God likes sacrifice. No issues. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. Now, obviously, I think you understand what this is talking about. Back in the Old Testament, now, I don't know about you guys, um, I didn't become a Christian until I was 23, 24 years old. I grew up in a Catholic church, right? And the Catholic church was great, not that I'm taking shots at them at all, right? It was great in the fact that um, I could go out on Friday nights and have a great time Friday and Saturday night, then Sunday show up, s- say my rosary, do my prayers, and it, was, it would cleanse me, and I'd start over again, right? That's kind of the same thing as Israel. Right? If they sinned, all they had to do was buy a turtle dove, get a lamb, get a ram, have, have the sacrifice, and be done. So they could do what they wanted to do and then cleanse it. That's what he's saying. He goes, yeah, you can be disobedient and then just kill the ram, or you can be obedient and not have to do the sacrifice. Right? Better to obey than to sacrifice. Right? So then what does Samuel call it? Verse 23, for rebellion. No mincing words, that one. That wasn't really an easy one. The fact that you didn't do what you were told or you didn't do wholly what you were told, Samuel says, is rebellion. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We're not going to get into witchcraft, but the idea, this isn't a positive thing. right? And stubbornness. Now, this is the blessing. In Russian, the word for stubborn is upyorkne. Right? In English, we have two words. We have stubborn, we have steadfast. Do you know what the difference between the two is? Steadfast, you're right. Stubborn, you're wrong. (laughs) Right? So if God says do this and you do it, you're steadfast. If mom says this and you don't want to do it, that's called stubborn. Right? So he says, and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry. I don't think God's really making this an easy one. He's saying, I told you to do this. It didn't look comfortable. It wasn't right. You thought it was a little bit over the top. You didn't do it wholly, so you're like a witch and an idolater. I'm not feeling the warm fuzzies from from Jesus at the moment. Right? Um, Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee, Saul, from being king. Now, remember we talked about historical, spiritual, doctrinal. Right? What we're going to see here is a really nice picture between Old Testament salvation and New Testament salvation. Saul says, it was told to do something, didn't do it. God says, that's it, you're done, cutting, the, cutting you off. Now, I want you to understand real, real quick there that, and we could talk about this for a long time if you want to get into the fun historical doctrine part of it. Saul really shouldn't have been king in the first place. I'm not saying God was wrong by picking up Saul, but the king of Israel, especially the first one, should have been from the tribe of Judah, Right? And Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin, so he really wasn't supposed to be the first king anyway. And we all know that David's getting set up to be king. Right? But it was kind of like God put this guy in here and set him up to fail. Next. What was the result? Oh, that's scary. Next. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. One sin done, everything's taken away from me. What do you mean? When I was in Ukraine, and God said, hey, listen, you need to go down to the war zone. You need to go to this place. You need to go to that place. You think, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Because I believe this with all of my heart. I'm sure you've heard this said before, but I really do believe it. That to be in the place that God has you to be, the center of God's will, is safer than a safe place out of the will of God. Does that make sense? So if he says, go here, go there. There, there was a time. <laughs> there was a time when I was in Odessa. Odessa's down in the Black Sea. That's a place that was getting bombed frequently. Right? I drove down to Odessa. 
and I stayed at one of my friends' house. I lived in Odessa for about six years. My best friend, the best man at my wedding, he lives in Odessa now, so I went down to stay with his mom for the time being. All right, so I went down there. I call her my Odessa mama. All right, I went and I stayed with them. All right, we went to sleep, got up the next morning, and I got up really early to drive across into Russian-occupied territory to get to a hospital and a church that I have there. Right? And I got up, I drove in, and as, I, as I'm on the road, it's about an hour drive to where I had to go. As I'm driving, my Odessa mama calls me up, and she goes, did you see it? I'm like, did I see what? She goes, the rockets that came in. Turns out that I had just left her house, right? and 30 minutes after I left, rockets had fallen within a quarter mile of where she lives. Like, that was a little bit scary, but still going forward. So I go forward, I get into, um, it's called Mikalai, is the name of the town. I get into Mick Alive. I go to the church there. Um, I start talking to them. I bring them the supplies that they were looking for. Talk to them, this, that, and the other thing. Um, I had wired my, I had hardwired my car with a refrigerator so I could bring insulin to the hospital there. Uh, you probably don't know. I was a professor. I teach international economics and I teach medicine, medical triage in English. So a lot of the doctors now are, or not a lot, some of the doctors now are um, my old students. I had done this for 15 years. So I had gone to the hospital. And as I was at the hospital with them, um, the church that I was just at just called and says, listen, you probably shouldn't come back to the church. Rockets just flew overhead. Okay, that's great. I get to the hospital. I'm in the hospital. Um, and <laughs> I was talking to, to the, the, the director of surgery now. right? And in Russian, they call me Pascal. That's just what my name is. So he says, uh, Pascal, do you remember what it is I got in your class? I mean, 15 years, thousands of students. I don't remember everybody's grade. He goes, I got a C. The equivalent of a C, they do it differently, but the equivalent of a C. I'm like, okay, so you got a C in medical English. You're the director of surgery now, so good job. He's like, no, 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 that's not the problem. Down in the basement, we have all of these medical supplies that Europe and America has sent to us. I'm like, sweet. He goes, yeah, it's all in English. <laughs> right. He goes, will you go down with the nurses and translate what's in the boxes? Okay, so we go down into the basement, okay, start translating what's in the boxes, First time in my life I had to figure out what the word kolostomy bag was in Russian. <laughs> like, when you have to explain stuff, you're like, it goes, and they're like, really? I'm like, okay, right, so we split up the box to get all this, right? Um, as, as I left there, right, another rocket actually hit the building across the street, split it in half. I'm like, okay, now I'm headed out, I'm driving into a place called Kherson, right? I'm getting to the border of Kherson because they're not going to let me in, right? Kherson is it's not a Russian occupied territory as much as it's where like the front is. So that's where they're lobbing here, lobbing here, back and forth, right? And there's block posts, which checkpoints, where they're not gonna let me in. So I get to the checkpoint where one of those guys that lives there is gonna drive out, come get me, grab the supplies and turn around and go back in. So he comes out to get me, right? And as he calls me up, he's gonna be late. And he goes, hey, Pascal. And I hear pop, 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 pop. I'm gonna be a little bit late. <laughs> yeah, you could be a little bit late. You're getting shot at, it's, it's okay. Right, so eventually he gets to me, I get the stuff in his car, goes back, right? Then I turn around, I'm heading back home, right? And I finally get back to Odessa Mama's house. We figured out that everything was okay. They, had, they put the fires out from, from the rockets, right? And then I was calling my pastor, let him know everything was okay, and I was headed home. And I told him the same story I told you. My pastor, because he's shootnik, he's a jokester like I am, right? He goes, don't come home. I'm like, what do you mean don't come? He goes, it looks like they're following you. You stay there. We don't want the rockets up here, right? <laughs> It was just kind of funny, right? The, the point is, I believe that when you're going and you're doing what it is you're supposed to be doing for the Lord, right, he miraculously takes care of the things that you couldn't control, okay? If you start listening to the surroundings, the people around you, um, it's going to slow down those things. There's, there's an old saying that I've tried to live by. It says, um, some people are like thermometers, and they let their surroundings determine whether they go up or go down. Some people are like tiggers, and they bounce up and down as much as they feel like. Don't be a thermometer. Don't let your surroundings determine whether or not you're happy or sad. You determine whether or not you're going to be happy or be sad. Right? I think the same thing with the Lord. If you have your whole 100% whole obedience, and you're following those things that he told, us, told you to do, right? and you're following those things, you're following them wholeheartedly, he, it's his job to take care of the details. But here... If you don't follow those things, he kind of took his hand off. I, I've said this a hundred times, and I'll, I'll say it till my dying day. I am never afraid of the chastening of the Lord. 
the Bible says that he will chasten the ones that he loves. He will spank them. He will correct them. He will tell me I'm right, I'm wrong. That's what God does. I am not afraid of that at all. I would rather he correct me. What I'm afraid of is if he's going to take his hand off and just let me be to myself. That scares me. Don't, don't leave me alone. Correct me. Put me back on the right path. This is what's going on with Saul. And Samuel said, next one, uh, there, thank you. And Samuel said, we read that, 27, and Samuel turned about to go away, and he laid hold on the skirt of his mantle. This is the part I wanted to talk to you about, right? The skirt of his mantle. Um, we can talk about the skirts real, real quick, right? We don't have to get really in-depth this. Do you remember the story of Ruth and Boaz, right, where Ruth was laying down when they were in the garden, and she said, please put your skirt over me, and that means make you a part of my family, um, Elijah passed his skirt, his mantle down to Elijah, right? Or the other way around. Elijah passed it down to Elisha, right? And um, made him kind of like his second generation, right? There's something, maybe if we think about it, I'm not saying that the Israel, Israelites are like the Scottish, right? But take that for a moment, like where they have their kilt and their colors make them part of the family, right? That's kind of this idea. So what Samuel reaches over, grabs his shirt and goes, your family line is done. You guys are not in the kingdom, or you're not the kingship anymore. That's basically what happened. Right? Why is that important? We'll get that in one second. Just keep in mind that skirt. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord had rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to the, thy neighbor of thine hand. We know that's David. He doesn't know that yet. All right? That is better than thou. That's an easy way to upset any guy, right? I know a guy who's better than me. <laughs> oh, yeah? Let's step outside. We'll figure out who's... No. Um, next. We talked about, all right, so he rejected the word of God, so God rejected him. That's Old Testament, right? New Testament, which is the reason why we read um, Isaiah this morning. In Isaiah, in the book of Acts, it actually says that God gave David the sure mercies, right? Meaning he didn't have that. But if we can be brutally honest just for a moment, who was worse, Saul or David? David was way worse. Adultery, murder, um, he had to kill off a couple of his sons. Saul, he just didn't kill off the sheep when he was supposed to. I mean, really? Which one of these guys? But who, who was more on God's side? Who did God use more? Right? Because David had the sure mercies. David had a special blessing from the Lord. But Saul just didn't kill off some things when he was supposed to. Right? Um, better than you, we talked about. Right? He laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle. This is what I want to talk about. Go to the next one. Uh, we talked about whosoever shall deny me before men, him I will deny before my father, which is in heaven. Okay? Right? That's what we're talking about. That's that Old Testament. You deny him, he denies you, you're done. There's no grace in there for your, for your sin. With David, there is. Next one. The better than you. Okay? We can skip that for now because I've been talking too much anyway. Go ahead. All right? He laid upon his skirt. Perfect. 1 Samuel 24. Remember, right, we're right now in 1 Samuel 15. So this is 24. So between 15 and 24, nine chapters... Right, this is where David and Goliath happened. David had to dance after killing the Amalekites and getting his wife, um, Michael. Right? And, and then he had to go hide in the cave. And then he was running, and David's mighty, mighty men. And there's a whole lot of chapters, a whole lot of history between 15 and 24. But in 24, it says in 1 Samuel 24, 11, Moreover, my father, see ye, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe. Do you remember when David met Saul in the cave? Remember that story? And David reached over and grabbed his skirt and went, <laughs> I always wonder why he did that. I mean, there's a lot of, take the guy's sword. That'd be a better idea than taking his skirt. I mean, I don't understand, right? Do you think, just for a moment, and this is, this is my point, and I can pretty much be done. Do you think for a moment that Saul remembered his time with Samuel when Samuel ripped his skirt? I mean, Samuel said, you're done. You were disobedient. Rip, your family is done. Then goes what? 10, 12, 15 years. I don't know the gap. I tried to figure it out and I couldn't figure it out the timeline. Right? There was a gap between when God actually, when he left the throne. And then David shows up, the guy that he's trying to kill, his son in law. And David rips his skirt and Saul goes, It's you. Because after this, go to the next one. It says, and it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, is this the voice of my son David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Saul lined up his voice and wept. And he said unto David, thou art more righteous than I. Now this sounds like a contrite heart. 
For thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. And thou hast showed this day how that thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into the hand, thine hand, thou killed me not, killest me not. For if I, for if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore, the Lord reward thee good, for thou hast done unto me this day. And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Swear now, therefore, unto me by the Lord, that if thou wilt not cut off my seed after me. And at this point, Saul actually understands. My time's done. My son-in-law is the new king, as long as he doesn't kill off my children after me. This is the point. It took that second reminder. What's the whole reason why I'm telling this whole long story back and forth? I believe that God puts those moments in all of our lives. My wife and I were having a discussion the other day um, when we felt the the pushing of God for us to have, to give a gospel tract to someone, to witness to someone, to spend more time with someone. And we were too busy. The the baby was crying. We had a full car of groceries that would have been ruined. It wasn't, nibble a gold nut. It wasn't going to be comfortable or convenient at that moment. And we didn't do it. And then later down, later down the road, we found out that something bad happened to that person. Or that that person, actually something good happened to that person, and we missed that opportunity to be obedient at that moment. What I'm trying to tell you now, and the whole reason for me saying this is, I want you to avoid those moments. If there's an inkling of the Lord in your heart to give a gospel tract, to speak to someone about Jesus Christ, to invite them to church, to just be nice to them, right? to give an offering. If you're sitting here, and, and this is not for me, right? we're not taking up anything for me, I, I don't need that, right? but maybe to give more to this, to help out this evangelical something or other, and you feel that inkling, it is better to do it and be wrong than not do it and regret. Right? I heard someone once say that the price is too high for me to do that, but that's because they haven't seen the price tag of regret yet. So, do you think Saul regretted his position? I think that he did. He lost the entire kingdom, not only for himself, but for the entire line of his children. I want you to not have that regret. Um, David, and this is the attitude, David had the same situation happen where he stood in front of Nathan, his prophet, and says, I want to build the Haram Borgia, the temple of God. I want to to build the the temple uh, for God. And God says, no, you can't do it. You're a bloody man. Why didn't he just kind of like, fine. I guess I can. You know what he did? He said, all right, fine. I can't do it. You're right. I'm bloody. I'm sinful. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to save up enough money and save up enough wood, save up enough materials where the next guy can do a better job for me. That's a great attitude. You're right. I, I was wrong. I sinned. I can't do this. But I can help someone else do it in my place because the glory of God was more important than his own stature. This is my point, and then I'm done, and I, I can see that I didn't take up all that much time. It's not <laughs> noon, like I said. Um, this is what I want you to do. Last one. Just go to the very, yeah, what does this mean for you? I don't know. I don't know what God tells you to do. I, I don't know if it said talk to that person at school, talk to that person at work, uh, sacrifice this, give this, go visit the gentleman that's in the hospital, um, Maybe he's calling you to go on the mission field. Uh, I, I, I get in a little bit of trouble. I do not believe that the children of a missionary are missionaries. That gets me in trouble in the field sometimes, especially when I'm talking to other missionaries at mission conferences. My dad was a gym teacher. He was a Marine Corps drill instructor and then a gym teacher, so not a big stretch. <laughs> and I guess if my dad was a Marine Corps drill instructor and a gym teacher, that makes me one too. Well, no, I, I had the benefits. Like, I always had a hockey puck, baseballs, basketballs, gloves. I mean, I always had the old sports stuff that we were throwing away at the school, so I got a benefit from my dad being, being a gym teacher, just like a missionary's kid get the benefit of le- learning, learning another language and picking up a different culture, but that doesn't make them missionaries, right? Um, maybe. We don't know. She's going to kill me in the car, so if you guys never see me again, it was my daughter who killed me and had to hit the body. She feels maybe. This isn't a stamp. 
that she feels maybe the Lord's calling her into missions to Japan. She's like a six-foot blonde. I don't, she's going to stand out really easy in Japan, but nonetheless. Right? I said, honey, if you stop wearing heels and give the guys cowboy boots, maybe you guys can look at it. Never mind. It's fine. Um, maybe someone's pushing you towards doing a missions trip. Maybe helping out the homeless. I don't know. I, I don't know. But what I'm trying to get you to do is listen for that voice of God saying, hey, maybe you're supposed to do something, and maybe it's going to be something uncomfortable, maybe a little bit over the top. And you're like, ah, I don't really want to do that. That's too much for me to ask. Like, why would I want to kill off the women and the children and the ox and the asses and the lambs? It didn't work out so well for Saul. Maybe you should try and be obedient. Because, you know, if we're, if we're trying to be obedient for Christ and we're wrong, I think we get bonus points. If we're not being obedient, that's called rebellion. It's that it's in witchcraft and stubbornness and idolatry. Father God, thanks. Thank you that you give us stories like this in the Bible. Lord, thank you that we are in the New Testament. And then we are saved by your blood, and then we get grace. So when we are not obedient, we still have forgiveness. Thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit who prompts us and pushes us and guides us. Lord, I don't know what I, where I would be in my life if, if you hadn't been gracious with me and you hadn't pushed me or prompted me in the, in the right direction. God, if in this building there are people that are listening to my voice and you have been prompting them, I'm asking on their behalf that you would do it again. They would push on them a little bit again. They would let them hear it one more time. Lord, we don't believe in coincidence because we believe that you're in control, right? But please give them another coincidence. Please give them another situation in their life where they can see that this is what you want. Give them a reminder. Make it a little bit louder that this is what it is you want them to do. And then, for their sake, for your sake, for the gospel's sake, give them the courage to follow it. Lord, they don't ever have to remember me. I, I, I don't care if they remember me. But if they would remember the lesson, they would remember the difference between how Saul handled it and how David handled it. Please, God, please prompt them to give a gospel track. Prompt them to talk to their relatives, their friends, their neighbors, their coworkers. Prompt them to give to the homeless guy, to the people that need it. Give them to whoever it is they're working with. God, prompt them to do something in your name and then show them how wonderful it is after the obedience to the Holy Spirit. I love you, and I pray that you give us wonderful fellowship in the afternoon. In your son, Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pat. I guess we all get to stand and sing hymn number 457, Take Time to Be Holy.
very much for your time and your gracious understanding. Um, please, in your prayers throughout the week, if you can remember Ukraine, it's still difficult over there, all right? Uh, bow for our, our last word of prayer. Father God, thank you again, Lord, for your graciousness. Lord, thank you for giving what I do. Also pray that uh, back at our church this morning that you'd be helping the, the pastor to preach through a translator. That would be fun for him this morning. I pray that uh, you were gracious and helpful to them. God, please help their afternoons, Lord, to be uh, a good one, to be uplifting and encouraging to you. Please help them throughout their weeks. And Lord, the gentleman that's in the hospital, God, I, I do sincerely pray for him. Lord, I pray that you would give him and his wife uh, peace and understanding, Lord, I don't know what you're going to work out there with um, the surgery or with the doctors. I pray that you give them wisdom and help, but Lord, I pray that you give them a peace in their heart where it's easier to go through these things. God, I love you, and I praise you in your son's name. Amen. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>